Teaching is an obstruction to learning. But there's a very important characteristic of teaching. How many of you have ever taught a class in a subject you never had as a student? I suspect most of you have. Who learned most in the classroom? <laughs> Although being taught is an obstruction to learning, teaching is a marvelous way to learn. What we are are professional learners, not teachers. A student once asked me, what's the last time you taught a course in a subject that existed when you were a student? I had to think about it. It was 1951. 1951, it's more than 40 years ago. Everything I've taught since then didn't exist when I was a student. The student looked at me and said, my God, you've had to learn a lot. He said, I wish you could teach as well as you can learn. That's what we ought to be about, the facilitation of learning, not teaching. The university and the college is upside down. The students ought to be teaching because that's a good way to learn. And we ought to be continuously learning so that we can enable them to learn more effectively. The principal purpose of an institution of higher learning ought to have two prongs to it. First, to enable students to learn how to learn. And secondly, to motivate them to want to do so. You see, 50% of what you learn in a university is irrelevant to what you're going to do later. How many of you remember how to take a square root? The other 50% will be obsolete within a couple years. Your success in life after leaving a university depends on your ability to learn in your job or in your activity what you need to know to do the job well. Your future depends on your capacity to learn and your motivation to do so. Motivation is absolutely critical. We ignore it. We almost deliberately design classes to demotivate students so that they don't want to learn. We make a chore out of it. I told a story yesterday with, of an experience I had that was really illuminating to me. My group at the university did a lot of collaborative work with a neighboring so-called black ghetto an area called Mantua consisting of 80 city blocks with 22,000 people in it, all black. It was referred to in the city in the 60s when we started working with them as the bottom. It has since received 17 national awards for its self-development effort. It's been the subject of seven major national television programs and its leadership has received all kinds of recognition. One day, its leaders came into my office and said, we got a problem, and maybe you can help us with it. We have too much illiteracy coming out of our schools. About 80% of the students, even coming out of high school, they said are functionally illiterate. What can we do about it? We said, we said why don't you get a hold of the Board of Education? They have a special group working on a literacy problem. They said, we've already done that. They came in, and they didn't do us any good. We said, well, we don't know anything about something, this, some, this product problem. And they said, well, that's an advantage because the people who do can't help us. So why don't you try? Well, we didn't know one thing about the community which turned out to be essential. Those kids were not stupid. They were smart as the devil. They weren't educated, but boy, were they smart. And therefore, if they weren't learning how to read, it's because they didn't want to. So we conducted research to find out why did they not want to learn how to read. Well, the results were incredible. 65% of the households in that area did not contain a book. The kids coming to school had never seen an adult read. Their model adults were not reading people but talking people. Their culture was oral, not literary. And then they come to school where a blonde white woman tells them that reading is the most important thing in the world. And they answer in two impolite words. <laughs> Secondly, we learned that when a young man reaches the age of 12, joining a gang was compulsory. It was the only way he could survive physically 
by moving around the neighborhood with friends that would help protect him. If, on the other hand, he was ever seen carrying a book, he would be physically attacked, even by members of his own gang, because a book was referred to as Whitey's Thing. It was capitulation to a dominating culture. And so he didn't carry books around. And he didn't read books at home, and he didn't see people reading books at home, and now we're trying to make them learn how to read. So rap was not an invention of the whites or the blacks. It's an oral culture. Well, what can we do about it? Well, we had an idea, and we fortunately had somebody who was willing to finance it in an effort to try it out. Julius Rosenwald, who is the son of the founder of Sears, lives in Philadelphia, and is an old friend, so we approached him, and he agreed to finance a very peculiar effort. We bought a complete set of Charlie Chaplin's silent films, put them in the auditorium of the schools in this neighborhood and played them during the entire school day. And any child was allowed to come and sit in the auditorium and watch Charlie Chaplin without an excuse from their teacher. By the end of that semester, every kid in the school could read. Why? They wanted to read the subtitles. They couldn't understand what was going on and they wanted to. And so they learned and it wasn't taught to them. They got motivated. Education has to focus on motivation. What excites people? Well, the great Spanish philosopher Ortega, Ortega y Gasset, has a marvelous book called The Mission of the University, in which he traces the evolution of revolutions. And he concludes that every major revolution in the world's history was created by what he calls a mobilizing idea. Ideas that excite people into action, holy grails of thought. How much effort do we put into the production and dissemination of mobilizing ideas? Ideas that diverge from the normal. You see, universities and colleges and the public schools are largely devoted to maintaining the status quo, not to producing change. There's a very remarkable man floating around this country in England by the name of Edward de Bono. Edward de Bono is responsible for the research that was initiated about two decades ago into the subject of creativity. He got into it in a very interesting way. He had married and they had their first child. And de Bono was fascinated by the development of his child, and so he began to log everything. You know, if the child said, ooh, he recorded. January the 4th, the child said, ooh. On January the 5th, he said, ah. And he put all this down, and pretty soon he observed that the child demonstrated remarkable creativity. He began to look at other children and discovered they were equally creative. The creativity was not a sparse competence. It was widely spread among children. And then he looked at adults and said, oh my God, what happened to them? Somewhere along the line, people who are born with a creative capability lose it. He said, why? Well, he never answered the question, but two others did. What he did is go on to create, create procedures for revitalizing the remnants of creativity in adults. They're called creativity enhancing procedures. And he wrote a famous book called Straight and Lateral Thinking in which he demonstrates some of those principles. But Jules Henry, an American anthropologist, wrote an incredible book called Culture Against Man. And Ronald Lang, a prominent British psychiatrist who recently died, wrote a book called The Politics of Experience. And they dealt with the why question. And they both came out with the same answer. We do it in school. We kill creativity. When you are given an examination in school and you read the question, what's the first thing that goes through the student's mind? They learn very quickly. The thing to do when you're given the question is to ask yourself a question. What's the question you ask yourself? What answer do they expect? Examinations are about trying to anticipate the answers expected by the teacher. 
expected answers cannot be creative because they're already known. If we use examinations at all, they ought to be about encouraging students to give us the unexpected answer because that's what creativity is about. It's about surprise, deviation from expectations. And furthermore, as Jules Henry pointed out, we don't even allow the students to ask the critical questions on their mind. What's so good about monogamy? What's so bad about premarital sex? What's so hot about our economic system? What's so good about democracy? Questions of this sort are not discussed with the kids. They're put aside and they learn very quickly not to ask important questions and not to provide important answers. And we wonder where creativity goes. It goes down the drain with conformity to expectations of the faculty which simply reflect the expectations of society. Jules Henry asked, what would happen if we encourage kids to ask the so-called improper question and to provide improper answers? He said, we would be confronted with more creativity than society has learned how to handle. And that's our fear, too much creativity. As a result, we have too little of it. I once got very tired of reading the handwriting of graduate students, like many of you have, I'm sure, even with undergraduates. So I came into a class at the beginning of a session one year and said, you're going to do a term paper. And out of that paper, I have to extract the content. I can't do it with your handwriting. You're going to have to type your paper, double space typing, on eight and a half by 11 white sheets with at least one inch margins. And I want the pages numbered in the upper right hand corner. Is that absolutely clear? And they all nodded and said yes. At the end of that semester, I received every paper typewritten as I had directed. And they were legible. But there was one that I got that was typed this way. <laughs> At the end of the paper, there was a little remark. It said, aha, uh -huh, I got you, didn't I? <laughs> My initial reaction was that damn kid knew what I wanted and deliberately wouldn't give it to me. I was going to reject this paper and then I stopped and reflected and said, My God, look what he did. He spent time trying to figure out how to fool me, how to surprise me. He was creative. So I gave him an A plus. And I added a note, don't ever try it again because it won't be creative the next time. <laughs> yeah. I have sat for years through faculty meetings. There are two things I've learned about it. One, uh, as a member of the faculty of the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, I was selected one year to be the Wharton representative on the faculty of the College of Engineering, the town school. And so for two years, I had to sit in town school meetings of the faculty. They were even more boring than the Wharton School meetings. And so having nothing else to do, I tried to record the subject matters discussed and the principal concepts used in the discussion. And in two years, the word student was mentioned only once. Only once. Faculty meetings were about the faculty, they're properly called. They weren't about students, they weren't about educational learning. They're about benefits and academic freedom and all this sort of stuff that affect the faculty. Schedules, but not about students. And I learned that the faculty operates on the assumption that it knows what the students need to know. And that's absolutely false. You haven't the foggiest idea what students need to know. I sat while engineers argued for hours about what courses ought to be required for a degree in engineering. And they ignored the fact, long known, that 65% of the graduate engineers do not practice engineering within five years after graduation. That 35% of the PhDs never practice in the field in which they receive their PhD. A few years ago, 
The American Statistical Association, one of the largest professional societies in the United States, had a 100th anniversary. And they did a very clever thing. They solicited the membership with a ballot, asking us to nominate the four people we would like most to address this at the 100th anniversary celebration to be held in New York. Now they got a whole bunch of names. They took the names most frequently mentioned, made a second ballot, and sent it out to get selection from that. And they proceeded, this is called the Delphi technique, until they got it down to four speakers. And those four were invited to address the 100th celebration. That was quite a to-do. It turned out that not one of the four who were selected by 15,000 members as the most important contributors to the development of statistics in the United States, not one of them had ever had a course in statistics. Proving the obvious thing that changes in the field are never produced by experts, but from outsiders looking at the field. How do we train people to look at things creatively and encourage them to do so? Rather than to act as a combination of a computer, a recording device, and a video camera, and simply spill back to them what we've given to them. That's not human. This is exemplified in the ultimate insult to human intelligence called computer-assisted instruction. What an insult to have a computer teach. The idea of having a computer teach a person, it's reversed. <laughs> At the Hawkins School in Cleveland, we did an experiment where we took second grade students. And this was a day when computers were complicated. Univac 2, you had the program in machine language. And we gave the second grade the responsibility for teaching the computer arithmetic. And in one semester, they learned two years, four semesters of elementary school arithmetic. How did they learn it? On their own, with help. They used the teacher as a resource, not as a teacher, but as somebody who would help them learn. Ellis Johnson, a professor at Johns Hopkins University who moved to Case Institute in the 1960s, got an experimental grant from the National Science Foundation and conducted a most unusual experiment. He took 60 of the accepted incoming students to Case Institute of Technology, undergraduates, and offered them a summer job prior to their entry to school. They all accepted because he offered a generous salary. They were put together in teams of five, and they were given the real problem to work on and to work for somebody in the public institution or private who had the problem to solve. So this was a realistic exercise. For example, one group was sent to Mayfield Heights, Ohio to improve the water supply system because the pressure was running low from overuse of the existing system. Another one was sent to another part of the Cleveland area to develop an emergency service for the new expressway that was built through the area, and so on. I was in Ellis's office one day when one of these groups came in working on the hydraulic problem he said, uh, Dr. Johnson, we've developed an equation to express the flow of water through this system. We'd like to show it to you and see if it's right. And they wrote it up on the board, and he looked at it. He said, no. And he said, that's, that's right. He said, now, here's our problem. What we have to do is manipulate these two variables so as to maximize the output. We don't know how to do that. Is it possible to do it? He said, yeah. I said, that's a problem in differential calculus. They said, well, can you teach it to us? He said, no. He said, well, how are we going to do it? He said, you've got to learn it. Well, how are we going to learn it? He said, well, I'll tell you where the books are. You can go get the books and read it. Now, if you have any problems, you can come and ask me about them, but I'm not going to teach it to you. Well, they did that. At the end of that summer, 95% of the students involved in that exercise passed the first two years of mathematics at Case Institute of Technology by examination. That's what I mean by teaching as an obstruction to learning. When motivated to learn mathematics, they learned at an incredible speed. Many years ago, we did research on alcoholism, 
and came out with a theory which we were able to test and prove valid. One of our students, a young man by the name of Robert Court, got very excited about it. He came to see me one day. He said, that stuff on alcoholism is really exciting. He said, I wonder if it would work on drug addiction. I said, well, it might in part, but I think there are different phenomena, so there'd be some required adjustment. He said, I'd like to look into it. Can you support me for a couple months while I try to find out something about drug addicts? We said, how much time do you want? He said, three months, and we dug up the money and gave it to him. He disappeared. Three months later, he appeared in my office and said, I've written a proposal for research on drug addiction. I'd like you to tell me what you think about it. He showed it to me, and it was incredible. With minor modification, I submitted it to the National Institute of Health and got $360,000 for research on drug addiction. That's not the point of the story. The point of the story is that Bob Court, the young man who did all this, was invited by the medical school of the Hospital of University of Pennsylvania to come over and give a course on drug addiction to the doctors. He never had a course in medicine, never known anything about drug addiction, but he came to campus as leading expert on the subject. How? He learned it. It wasn't taught to him. I had a group of foreign students from less developed countries come in to see me one day, headed up by a young Peruvian named Francisco Sagasti, and seconded by a young lady called Virginia Melo. She was Brazilian, he was Peruvian. They said a number of the faculty here have done work on planning for development of less developed countries. Why don't we have a course on planning for development for less developed countries? I said that was a great idea. He pointed out that we had students in our student body from 13 less developed countries. They'd make an anxious group of students. I said, no, that wasn't acceptable. They could teach such a course. He said, well, what do you mean? If we were to teach the course, who would be the students? I said, the five members of the faculty that you've identified. He said, you mean you would actually come as students to the class? I said, yes. He said, will you attend regularly? We said, uh, yes, if you don't bore us. We will behave just like you do. Will you read the assignments? Well, if they're worth reading, and so on. He said, that's awfully difficult. He said, we can't give such a course until we know what you already know. I said, right. He said, how are we going to learn what you already know? I said, that's your job. That's what we have to do when we teach. We've got to find out what you already know. So you do the same for us. He said, well, can we do it next semester rather than this one? He said, yeah. And they did. Those 13 students put on the best course I have ever taken. Francisco Sagasti became the chief strategic planner for the World Bank and is now the chief planner for the government of Peru. Virginia Melo is the chief planner for the government of Brazil. And every one of those 13 people hold a major planning function in a less developed country. They were so excited by their experience of learning through teaching. We've got the university and the college upside down. We think we know what they have to learn that's unimportant. What's important is that they learn how to learn. Now, a few other characteristics of our educational system that have to be changed. We make an absolutely incredible assumption that the world is organized the way a university is. Now, what's that mean? Well, we say experience involves physical problems, chemical problems, psychological problems, social problems, economic problems, philosophical problems, religious problems, and so on. There are different kinds of problems. And so we organize around these different kinds of problems. We take reality apart into disciplines. And we think a discipline represents reality. There is no such thing as a physical problem, a chemical problem, a social problem, an economic problem. Those are absolute illusions. Those adjectives don't tell you a damn thing about a problem. They tell you something, but not about the problem but we treat them as though they tell you something about the problem. We don't even tell students what the origin of disciplines is. 
One of the most exciting things I ever read is the first sentence of a book called On Human Communication by Colin Cherry, a British cybernetician and information theorist who spent 1976 on a sabbatical year at MIT and wrote this book. And the first sentence of the book reads as follows. The German philosopher Leibniz was probably the last living man who knew everything. What an exciting idea. So I went back to look into it. He was literally true. Leibniz spoke 12 languages. He made major contributions to mathematics and science as we knew it that day. The entire domain of science was capable of being contained in a single human brain. But after Leibniz, that became increasingly impossible as the domain of human knowledge enlarged. The first division that occurred, occurred at the time of Newton. Newton was not a professor of physics. Physics didn't exist, it didn't exist when Newton was there. Newton was a professor of natural philosophy. Because the first division that occurred in the domain of human knowledge was between philosophy and natural philosophy. Now, they didn't have the guts to call the other part unnatural philosophy, which it was. And then natural philosophy divided into physics and chemistry. And as recently as 1900, there were only six sciences, physics, chemistry, biology, psychology, and sociology, six sciences. Currently on the register of the National Research Council are 450 disciplines. See, disciplines are an effect of nature. They represent a filing system for knowledge. They're exactly a filing system. You probably have a file in your office with multiple drawers, and one drawer reads A to C, and the next drawer D to F, and so on. They're ways of retaining information so you can get access to it easily. The fact that Armco Steel and Alcoholics Anonymous are in the same file don't mean a damn thing. It's just a convenient way of getting them. If you rearrange your file by date of receipt rather than alphabetically, you wouldn't change the content one bit. You just change your way of access to it. Now, all the disciplines are, are labels on files. They're nothing about the content of the files. That's an absolute illusion. Let me give you an example. This ghetto that I referred to earlier, so-called ghetto, uh, in its development process, started to meet with the faculty, a select group of the faculty the university regularly every Monday morning. And during one of these Monday morning meetings, which were occurring in my office, a young man from the community came in with a piece of news that stopped the meeting absolutely dead. We had to terminate because of the sadness of the information. There was an 83-year-old woman who lived in the neighborhood who had organized what we called a geriatric set. These were elderly people who were retired, most of them on welfare or social security, who had organized things like infant care centers. They took care of children from several weeks old up till the time when they were old enough to go to a daycare center so that their unwed teenage mothers could either return to school or go to work. They cleared vacant lots to make them usable as recreation and rest centers. They planted trees in the neighborhood and flowers and things of this sort. They were a real boon to the neighborhood. We were able to do something for that woman indirectly. That neighborhood had absolutely no medical facilities whatsoever. And we got the University of Pennsylvania Hospital to open a free clinic in the neighborhood, which was the first time they had medical services available to them. This enabled this old woman to go there once a month for a checkup, which she needed because she had a bad heart. She had gone to that clinic that morning and had gone through the usual check, had passed it, and they had released her to go home. Home were two rooms at the top of an old four-story house that had been converted into a tenement. And on the third flight of stairs, on her way to her home, she had had a heart attack and died. That's the news that was brought to us. And so we sat around the room silently, and the first one to speak was a professor of community medicine who was in the room, Sam Martin. 
He said, damn it, I told you we don't have enough doctors in the clinic. You see, if we had more doctors in the clinic, we'd be able to make house calls for patients that shouldn't be coming to us. We should be going to them. We've got to arrange to get more doctors. There was silence. Jerry Adams, the economist, spoke up next. He said, Sam, there are plenty of doctors in Philadelphia. That's not the problem. He said, the problem is they're private practitioners, and she couldn't afford to call one. If her welfare payments or health benefits were higher, this never would have happened. She'd been able to call a doctor to her home to give her the exam. Silence. Professor of architecture said, why don't we make them put elevators in all those buildings? And then the only woman present, the professor of social work, shook her head and said, my God, what a pity. None of you know anything about that woman. Don't you know she was married and had a son? She was deserted by her husband shortly after the son was born. And by working in house cleaning, she raised that son, managed to get him through school at the top of his class. He got a scholarship and came to Penn and got a degree in arts and sciences. Graduated at the top of his class and got a scholarship to the law school. He went to the law school, graduated at the top of his class, and is now, after several years of employment in one of the Philadelphia law firms, a major principal in that firm. He is married and has two children. He lives in the suburbs on the so-called main line in a beautiful home with two children and a wife and happens to be a bungalow. And if she weren't alienated from her son, she'd be living with him where she'd have all the money she needs and no steps to climb. Now, here's the question. What kind of a problem was that? Is that a medical problem, an economic problem, an architectural problem, or a social work problem? It's none of them. It's a problem. Those adjectives describe the point of view of the person looking at the problem. They don't tell you anything about the problem. They tell you about the person looking at it. But that's not the way we teach disciplines. We give students the wrong impression that they tell you something about the problem. Now, I've had the remarkable opportunity to work in over 400 different corporations in my lifetime and more than 75 government agencies in over 17 different countries. And I've never run across a problem that couldn't better be solved somewhere other than where it was recognized. But what happens in reality? In a corporation, a marketing manager comes in one morning and finds out the sales dropped in New England. Uh-oh, he says, we got a marketing problem. He now takes possession of that problem because it's a marketing problem and tries to solve it by the manipulation of marketing variables. But that problem may be much better solved someplace else. But that never occurs to him because he was taught there is such a thing as a marketing problem. This is what interdisciplinarity is all about. I told a story yesterday which illustrates this perhaps better than anything I can say. It's a story of an office building in New York City, which at the end of World War II received increasing complaints from its tenants about the poor elevator service. These complaints kept mounting, and management didn't know what it could do about it. But eventually, some of the major clients in the building, multi-floor occupants, like accounting firms and law firms, threatened to break their lease and move out because their, uh, their employees were complaining so much about long delays for elevators. So management finally took the problem seriously, did a little inquiry and found out there's a group of elevator engineers or experts in the area and they called them and asked them to come in. Explain the difficulty and the engineer said, we have to do a survey to find out how serious the problem is. And so they were authorized to do so for a fee, of course. And they came back several weeks later and said, you got a problem. The average waiting time for an elevator in this building is about two minutes. They said the American standard is 20 seconds, which means that you're keeping waiting, people waiting six times as long as the desirable average. You got a problem. The manager said, what can we do about it? The engineer said, there are only three things you can do about it. One is you could add elevators. That means you'd have to take part of the building that's occupied by other things now and put elevators in. 
The second thing you do is use automated elevators, which move more quickly than the old elevators which you've got. The third thing you can do is introduce computer controls to your elevator system. This would enable an elevator when it reaches the 20th floor and there's nobody waiting above to go down to the first floor instead of going up to the top before it comes down. This saves time and increases the availability of elevators. And management said, which one of these is the best? He said, we don't know. You have to do research to find out. So they got a great big juicy contract. They went off and did the research, came back after several months and a couple million dollars later and said, you've got a problem. What do you mean? He said, well, in order to add a sufficient number of elevators to solve the problem, you've got to reduce the rentable space in this building by an amount that you can't possibly justify by the change in income. It would be a bad investment. Well, what about automating the elevators? Well, that will only reduce the time to about one minute, which is still three times too much. What about computer controls? Same thing, they said. Well, what are we going to do, said management. Engineers said, you can't do anything. It's an old building, and it's, a, it's the cost of age. And they left. Complaints kept going on, and finally management became absolutely desperate and decided to do something would never do under normal circumstances. These were absolutely unique conditions. So they called a meeting of their subordinates. The head of each department in the building was called and everyone came, a large building like this employs between two and 400 people, except the head of personnel department. He was off on a trip and he sent his young assistant, who was a recent graduate in personnel psychology from Penn State. And when they entered the room, management described the problem to them and the result of the engineering study. He said, what I want to do here today is brainstorming. He said, now this is what brainstorming is. I'm going to ask you if you have any ideas of how we can solve the problem, and somebody will make a suggestion. Now, nobody can say what's wrong with this suggestion, why it won't work. If you don't think it'll work, you have to say what you would do to it to make it workable. So every contribution has to be constructive, working our way toward a solution. Is that understood? And everybody nodded. He said, okay, let's have a suggestion. Somebody raised his hand and made it, and everybody immediately told him why it wouldn't work. Three or four of these occurred in a row, and pretty soon people stopped making suggestions. There was a long silence in the room, and the manager got desperate up at the front of the room, and finally he looked at the young man. He said, you haven't said a word. He said, don't you have any ideas? He said, sure. He said, I do have an idea, but I'm ashamed to present it. He said, people will make fun of me. He said, we, we don't have the luxury of making fun of you. What's your idea? And the young boy told him. Two weeks later, at a cost of $500, the problem was dissolved. Now, what had he done? See, everybody had said the problem consists of slow or not enough elevators. We've got to add elevators or increase their speed. But that's not the way the young man looked at it. He said, people standing there for two minutes are bored. They've got nothing to do, and they're complaining about the boredom. Therefore, how do I entertain them so they won't mind the wait? It's a very different problem. Hmm? The solution was simple. He put mirrors up in the lobby so they could spend their time looking at each other. <laughs> that has become standard practice. You will find now in most modern buildings, elevator lobbies will have mirrors all around. Because now the men can look at the women without appearing to do so, and vice versa. <laughs> That's what interdisciplinarity is all about. It means exploring the different points of view around the problem to find which one or combination of points of view will give you the best solution. Nobody owns a problem. Every problem is universal. Okay? So a university is not organized the way reality is or vice versa.